Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Takiwa Smith. I'm the founder and executive director of Science Engineering Mathematics. And I want to welcome you to the session of our Math Science Podcast. Our topic of live and partnership with the board of the Society. So I will for later. But I think that. Um, it's finishing up right now finishing up right now and so as you know still sheltering place and thinking about things that you can do at home learning is a wonderful activity you can do in your backyard or at your local um, I walked in my neighborhood a few months ago and I saw all kind of birds other than the ones that wake me up before the sun rises. So I'm going to turn it over to our speaker for a little bit more about the program. Hi everyone, as Tukula said, my name is Tukula, um, and I'm um, As today's speaker, she is the Education Program Coordinator for the Georgia Auto. Um, she's the University of Washington, Bachelor's of Education, and she is Special interested in urban education. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Kiana. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Again, once again, my name is Kiana Leverett, and I am the education program coordinator for Georgia Audubon. And today I'm here to teach all of you guys about some of the common birds here in Atlanta. Now a popular phrase that we like to say is that we're going birding. So today, when once you learn these birds, I encourage you to take what I tell you and then see if you can find them in your own backyard. Because in the metro Atlanta area, all of them are what I like to call native. They're common. You can see them around all the time. And then in addition to teaching you guys about birds, I'm also going to be teaching you about some bird-related careers that you can do if you're interested in learning more about birds or getting involved in helping take care of their species. So this first bird on the first slide, straight off the bat, is a ruby-throated hummingbird. It's a very popular migratory bird, very, very small. And you notice that it's called a ruby-throated hummingbird because of its ruby throat. Awesome. So the first bird I would like to talk about is the American robin. And when you're birding, there are certain things that you want to look for in order to, one, find a bird, and two, figure out what that bird is. So what I like to do oftentimes is bird by ear, because you will hear a bird before you see a bird. And there are so many birds to see. There are over 600 species of birds that are native to the state of Georgia, but 250 of them can be found right here in Atlanta. And all the birds that I'm going to show you guys today on these slides are what I like to call perching birds. So they like to sit on top of trees, in tree branches, and they're very easy to spot and also common. So the American robin, when you first hear it, it uses a phrase that I like to call mnemonics. And mnemonics are words that we use or phrases that you can remember that help you tell what the bird is. Kind of like when you're doing math and you do the order of operations and you think of, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, to help you remember the way that you're supposed to do two different equations, listening to mnemonics will help you understand what bird it is by comparing it to a phrase that you've heard or that you're familiar with. So the mnemonic that you use for an American Robin is cheerily, cheer up, cheerily. And they're very, they're known for their bright orange breast and their orange beak. They can be found almost anywhere. They're sometimes seen trailing on the ground. Other times 
They are seen perching on branches. They love berries. So if you have berry bushes in your backyard, that's a great place to find an American Robin. The next bird has a mnemonic called Chickasee DD. And this is, of course, the Carolina chickadee. And what's really cool about identifying this bird is that the Carolina chickadee just says its name. So if you're ever listening and you hear a shrill, and shrill means sharp, tone of a bird saying chickadee dee dee, in the morning time when you wake up, you know that that's a chickadee. Now this bird, this is a close up shot of a Carolina chickadee, but it's a slightly smaller bird than a, an American robin. And you can notice it from its black cap or head, white eye line, and how it has a grayish breast. So the first career that I wanna to talk to you guys about today is field research and it is exactly what it sounds like. It's the collection of raw data and raw means straight from a file, you don't edit your data at all, you just write down what you see from the outside world through observation and interaction. Now, these are pictures that I took me personally. I've done field research before in Kansas with dick thistles. This is me with the dick thistles. I am banding them. And there are other methods to research birds in the field. Banding is when you catch birds and you attach little colored bands or sometimes trackers to help you identify birds that you've seen before so that you can count numbers or to identify where birds are going or coming from. Another, op another observation method to use is sitting and observing. A lot of times birds are so hyper aware of us that they talk and communicate with each other without even us even realizing it. And the best way to understand birds is for them to get comfortable with you. And for them to get comfortable with you, sometimes that just requires you sitting still and waiting for them to become comfortable with your presence. When I was doing field research, I would just sit on a hill and wait for the birds to get tired of saying, she's here, she's here, which is them chipping and telling each other to stay away from me because they thought I was a threat. But once they realized that I wasn't, they left me alone. And mist netting is when you take a very long net and you let the birds gently fly into the net, you help them out. It's a method to catch birds if you need up close interaction. Bird number three is a really popular one. It's very, very easy to spot. Its mnemonic is purdy purdy or cheer cheer. And it is a Northern Cardinal. Now there are two pictures and they look very, very different. One, you see the bright red Cardinal that you're used to seeing with the orange beak and the black mask over his face and the very, very, very stout tail feathers. But when you look at the other bird, it also has an orange beak. It also has a tuft, which is like the crown on top of a bird's head. And that's a little bit reddish, but this bird is a different color. The biggest difference between these two birds is that one of them is female and one of them is male. The male bird oftentimes in the animal kingdom will always be the brightest, the flashiest bird, the bird that sings the most. And why do you think that is? Well, oftentimes birds will have bright colors to attract a mate. Sometimes they will sing to attract a mate. Other times they will have amazing flight patterns and do beautiful things in the air in order to impress a female, which oftentimes is the duller bird. And why do you think they're the duller bird? That's because they typically camouflage. A female bird will sit on a nest and want to protect its eggs. And hiding and using camouflage and not being as bright or flashy is the best method that they have to protect their young, besides where and how they build their nest. So when you're out, you just have to, if you can't see a cardinal, Listen for the purdy purdy or the cheer cheer and see if you can find a cardinal. This next bird is a bird that I hope all of you guys are familiar with. 
It's very near and dear to your state. It's mnemonic is drop it, drop it, cover it up, cover it up, and as well as pick it up, pick it up. And this is Georgia's state bird, the brown thrasher. Now, when you look at the brown thrasher, obviously it's in the name that it's brown. That's one way to figure out what it is. Another way to figure out what a brown thrasher is is by looking at the spots on its breast and seeing just what those look like. And if you're close enough to a bird to see or make out its silhouette or the shape of the bird, take a look at his beak. Oftentimes a bird's beak can tell you what kind of food it eats and where you might find it. So this bird has a sharper beak compared to our cardinal friend. Different beak means different diet. Oftentimes you'll find a brown thrasher in a bush, a berry bush. A bush, they love beauty berries, they love blueberries, I love blueberries too. They love blackberries and they like to perch up in those, they don't, you don't really find them in tall trees, but you will find them in low perching flowering bushes. So if you have some in your backyard, maybe check for a brown thrasher. Be careful because they get really, really loud when they're being territorial. The next career I wanna to talk to you guys about is bird rehabilitation. And this is my coworker, Melanie. And bird rehabilitation is when you examine and provide care to sick, injured, and orphaned wild animals. The purpose of animal rehabilitation is to get animals well enough to return to their habitats. So they're not to be made pets. Oftentimes animals and birds that you see rehabs might be ones that you wouldn't expect that are found all around us all the time, like raccoons, possums, reptiles, turtles, and also even into bigger animals like beavers, owls, hawks, so that they can go back to their homes and their habitat. This is sort of like a hospital for wild animals, except they're not pets. And a really popular animal rehab facility in Metro Atlanta is AWARE Wildlife Center. It's in Stonecrest. And AWARE stands for the Atlanta Wild Animal Rescue Effort. So if you ever find a baby bird on the ground or you find an animal and you're not sure if it's in the right place, you can call them or any other rehabilitation facility and they can tell you what steps to take. But if you do find one, don't touch it before you call somebody or you know the correct steps on what to do. Animal rehabbers are all about creating spaces and putting animals back into the rightful places so that they can continue on in their own ecosystems. All right, bird number five. Now this is a bird I'm sure that all of you guys have seen, and I'm also sure that it looks like a bird that's probably very familiar to you. It's mnemonic is who, 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 who. This bird is a morning dove. To me, morning doves kind of sound like they're sad, and they're, if you look at how they're shaped and the puffiness in their bodies, you can tell that they're related closely to pigeons and rock doves, which are also native birds. The only difference is when you look at the colors and how bright, how bright it is compared to a pigeon, which is more of a gray, this is more of a tan. So if you see them in the sunlight and they like to, you can find them more commonly on the ground or in berry bushes, just like brown thrashers. <clears throat> you'll see, hopefully you'll find a morning dove, but it's more common to hear one than it is to see one. This bird looks just like this in real life. He's very, very small. His mnemonic is tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And this is a Carolina wren. wren this Carolina wren is easy to spot if you see its silhouette. It's very, very small, it can probably fit in the palm of your hand, but when you look at its tail and how erect his tail is and how it's sticking up, a Carolina wren's tail is always flat. It's always erect. It's never 
laying down. It's always either straight out or up if, it, if the wren is alert. And marks to look for is its brown color, if you can see it, and its white eye patch above its eye. Those are the biggest things that you notice about this bird. And I want to take the time to mention that all these birds are common because they are native to the southeast region. This is their habitat. And a habitat is made up of a bunch of things, but the most important things involving a habitat are space, food, water, and resources. So when you think about your habitat, where you live, your habitat would be your home. It's where you have your space, it's where you eat, it's where you feel most protected, and birds seek out habitats that best suit them. So this bird particularly, also because of its sharp beak, it likes to crack open acorns and other nuts. So you'd find it in a tree that might have some nuts or some acorns falling from it if you're looking for it. And then just listen for that mnemonic again, the tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. The next career that I want to talk to you guys about is animal ambassador keepers or animal ambassadors for short. These are people who take care of animals that are meant to be public figures for their species. So if you've ever been to a zoo or an aviary or an animal sanctuary and you see the person that comes out to you with the animal, whether it's a snake or a possum or a squirrel or even a turkey vulture like my friend and coworker Karina Newsom is holding, you will see that all these animals oftentimes are either animals that are kept and non-releasable. And so they're used and put up in a public forum in order to raise awareness about the species. It helps get people interact with wildlife because oftentimes the more you know about something, the more interested you are in preserving it, protecting it, taking care of it, or even just showing a care or sharing it with somebody else who also might care. So there are a lot of animal ambassador keepers all over the place. The most common places that you'll find them are animal sanctuaries, aviaries. There are a lot of them at the zoo and at rehab facilities like AWARE. Bird number seven. So this bird is itty bitty. You'll find him in the treetops and his mnemonic or the sound you listen for when you hear the bird is here, 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 or Peter, 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 and it goes very, very, very fast. So here, 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 or Peter, 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 it's very sharp and very high pitch. This is a tufted titmouse, and a tuft is the crown that sits on top of its head. Most of you know it or notice a tuft on a bird like a cardinal, that sharp piece of feathers that sticks up above its head when you're looking for a bird. And this bird, you'll know it by its sharp and sometimes groggy sounding tone. So it's sharp, but at the same time, it's still very much so heavy, if that makes sense. It has a big voice for a very small bird. The next bird, you might hear it's chur, 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 but most of the time you'll hear it's buzz, 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 or see what it has done. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. Now I know what you're saying or thinking, Kiana, why is it a red-bellied woodpecker if its head is red? And most woodpeckers, especially the ones that are native, native to the Southeast region have some form of red on their bodies. There's a pileated woodpecker that also has a red head, except it's red is a tuft. The red-bellied woodpecker is known for its red head and then the fantastic covering on the back of his feathers. Now this bird, as you might have guessed, because it's a woodpecker, has a really sharp bill and will buzz holes up and down a tree in order to search for food, to dig out cavities, to eat, to eat sap, or just to make homes or to impress a mate. There are so many reasons. And the cool thing about a woodpecker compared to other birds is that because it's hammering into trees, its beak reaches all the way around its skull for extra protection for its brain. 
So oftentimes if you can't see the red on a woodpecker or you're not, or you're not sure where to find it, just try to listen for the buzzing. Look for long trees or trees that look sturdy or even sometimes look for dead trees because although woodpeckers like to eat on living trees, they like to nest in dead ones. Another career that I'd like to talk to you guys about is habitat conservation, which is cultivating, creating, and rehabilitating natural habitats so that wildlife can flourish in their native surroundings. And the best part about this career is that it's something that you can volunteer for. So Georgia Audubon has volunteer opportunities where you can go out and help us rehab a site. There are also other great nonprofits in the city of Atlanta, like Trees Atlanta, where you can actually go out and plant trees and create habitat for birds. Atlanta is oftentimes called the city in the trees. And that's because we have so much critical canopy, but it's also just as, as important as it is to have a lot of trees, it's also very important to have a lot of habitat. And the best way to have a lot of habitat is to fill it with natural plants. The birds that are meant to be here feed on the plants that are native to this land and native to this area. So if you're planting things that are not native, the birds might not like it as much as they would something that is native. And if you have a yard or a balcony or a windowsill, you could get or collect native plants to fill there. Some of my favorite native plants would be beautyberry. Um, I love crepe myrtle and plants to get rid of or to take away from your yard would be things like kudzu, which are like the vines that grow up trees or wisteria, which, which are like thicker, more viscous vines and nandina, which really looks like holly. So it has waxy leaves that look like holly leaves and red berries, but although they look pretty and they're easy to maintain, they're also very, very bad for birds. So you can put more native plants in your yard or wherever you are, and you'll be creating habitat, creating sanctuary for birds. And then Georgia Audubon also as well has a backyard sanctuary certification program where we have volunteers that will help you bring your yard up to a native wildlife sanctuary standard. And then you can certify your own yard as a native sanctuary. So bird number nine, it's very, very noticeable, very popular. If you have seen birds in books, I'm sure you've seen this one. It's mnemonic is JJJ or Quedal, Quedal, Quedal. This is a blue jay. It has a tuft just like a cardinal or a tufted titmouse, but this bird I would say is an agitator. They are a little bit bigger than some of the birds that I've shown you so far, and they use their size to their advantage and take over habitats. So they're real bullies, I would say, in the bird world. But you notice them obviously for their bright blue feathers and their white bellies if you're ever looking for one. Or if you're listening for one, listen for the loudest call. And that might just be a blue jay. The last bird I wanna to talk to you about is a Northern Mockingbird. And I don't have a mnemonic for this bird because it has many mnemonics and many words. It is called a Mockingbird because it tends to mock different sounds around it in order to mask its own presence and scare away either claim its territory, scare away predators that potentially could affect its health, or just because. So mockingbirds can sound like cats. There's also another bird called a gray cat bird that sounds like a cat. There are, they can sound like car alarms. They can sound like crows or cardinals or robins. They are talented. Similar to how parrots, if you, if you train them, can sound like us, northern mockingbirds tend to sound like other animals to scare off predators. So 
whenever you're walking on a path or through your or through your neighborhood, think if you hear a cat meowing, that might not be a cat. And the last career that I want to talk to you guys about is wildlife photography and film. And people that do or have this profession journey into different areas of the world to help capture animals in their natural habitat. And their photos can their photos and their film can end up in wildlife magazines like Natural Geographic, can end up on nature documentaries like Disney Nature or Planets or any number of documentaries that feature different animals or Animal Planet or National Geographic if you watch TV. Also, they if you have calendars in your home and you wonder how those pictures got to the calendars, a wildlife photographer probably took that photo. And then also, when you go to the library, if you go to the library, nonfiction books, even textbooks, when you learn about science and you wonder how those photos got there, some wildlife photographer or filmographer took those photos or those shots and it involves a lot of patience, but the reward is amazing. So with that all being said, I hope and encourage all of you guys to go birding on your own, to bring someone else with you. The best time, in my opinion, to go birding is very, very early in the morning. And just to give you guys a definition, birding to me is just watching birds. I would say that there are great ways to bird, but you can bird wherever you are, whoever you are. You can bird in the middle of a city and still find a lot of things. Or you can bird where there are lots of trees or in the middle of a nature trail or on your back porch. The important, the important thing is, is that I suggest you give it a try because you never know what you'll find. And to me, finding a new bird or discovering or figuring out that you know what that bird is, is the best part. And it, birding is for everyone and for anyone. So I encourage you to try birding on your own. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you for your time. All right. Um, so if um, I'm wondering, there was a, a little noise in the background. I don't know if like it would help if you turn down your sound um, a little, just a tad. Um, but uh, are there any questions that we have um, for Kiana on um, her role at the Georgia Audubon? Again, she is the education program coordinator. Uh, any questions about birding related careers? Um, I know I had some questions about um, what you brought up. Um, first of all, I love how you use the term query, and um, I was wondering if you could talk to the importance of um, having this um, environment and um, a lot of times something like bad rep, but um, you know, there are it's um, including rehabbing animals that need it for, um, you know, entities like zoos and sanctuaries. Sure. So wildlife sanctuaries, or to me, is really just the act of creating space for animals, creating space, finding places where they can feel welcome and where they can go. And a lot of times it's not it's not necessarily about donating money toward a zoo or going a place to see a sanctuary oftentimes you can create if you have a home you can create a sanctuary right there because the whole city can be a sanctuary the more native plants there are a sanctuary to me is a safe haven, a place where they are safe where they're protected where things are healthy where it's good where it's good for them and their well-being and the more native plants there are in a specific area, the more, and the better, honestly, the better it will be for the birds. So I would encourage anyone and everyone, if you don't do anything, or if you can, at least try to plant some native plants in your yard. If you like flowers, 
There are native flowers. If you like berries, there are native berry bushes. If you like trees, there are native trees too. And there are also resources and people that can teach you one, about all these plants and two, will help you build them, help you find them and help you put them in to your yards. Nice. Um, and I definitely want to follow up on that. Before I do, um, someone said that um, they really enjoyed your pres that uh, her kids really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I did too. Uh, I loved the photos that you shared. And I really feel like they gave us uh, an up close uh, view of these beautiful creatures. And so um, as you were just talking about and being able to create sanctuaries in our backyards, like what, what can we do in order to get closer to birds? Um, I know you mentioned that there are volunteer opportunities for organizations like the Georgia Audubon, um, but, um, and, you know, as far as in addition to um, creating sanctuaries, um, you know, people creating like uh, bird feeders and things like that nature so that they can get closer to these beautiful animals. Oh, yes. So some things that you can do to help bring birds to you are definitely hanging feeders, um, putting out bird baths. If you have a yard, um, a great suggestion would be to mow your yard less and use less pesticides. And then if you have leaves in your yard, leaves on the ground, leaving them there every once in a while and not, necess not necessarily raking them up all the time because a lot of times you'll find insects in those leaves and in those piles and more birds will flock if there are more insects. Another great thing that you can do is if you have pets, or specifically if you have cats, is to not let them outside. Cats are one of the biggest, the biggest killers of birds in urban areas, stray cats. So I would say a big, another big thing to do is if you do have a cat to not necessarily let that cat outside of your home, like in your backyard, because you never know what it might find and who it might find. Um, so I said, putting out bird feeders. We talked about bird baths and cover on your ground. Another thing that I would suggest that you do is if you can, build a birdhouse and put out a birdhouse. Um, Atlanta, Georgia Audubon sells birdhouses, but I also encourage you to make your own. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. Sometimes it can just be a box that has a lot of bird feed in it. So those are those are the biggest things that I would suggest to you. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, you can use um, items that you would recycle around your house, like plastic bottles, um, to make bird feeders. You could even you could either you could even use fruit. Um, to, <laughs> to attract birds um, to your front yard. So we definitely encourage you to do that. Um, someone asked, uh, what is your favorite bird? Okay, so to answer that question, I have a couple favorite birds. Um, my first favorite bird is probably the bird that got me most interested in birds at first which is a dick thistle. So I got my start with birds when I was in college. I went to go do research in Kansas on the Conza Prairie Long-Term Ecological Research Station in Manhattan, Kansas. And I was studying bird behavior, so how they move and why they move the way that they do. And the bird that I was studying was called a dick thistle. And it's a tiny yellow bird. It was the one in the pictures on my field research slide. And that bird to me was so special because it really taught me to sit and kind of pay attention. I was learning how to bird doing research without even really realizing that I was birding or bird watching. But it was a form of research at the time. And then it got me more interested in doing it on my non-research time. And then my other favorite bird, I would have to say, is a crow because I think that they're American crows. I feel like are very misunderstood. Oftentimes people look at them like 
they're bad omens or they're scary, but I guarantee that everyone who is on this has heard a crow that caw, caw, caw at least once before. And what I appreciate most about them is how intelligent they are. So a crow might pick a nut out of a tree and then drop the nut in the middle of a street just so that a car can run it over instead of the bird itself having to crack, crack open that nut. So it knew that by dropping the nut in the middle of the street, the cars below or the bikes below or even the people would do the work for him. And so he would just sit and wait. They're, they have very, very, very high intelligence. And I really think that's cool. And I think their behavior is interesting. Yeah, that, that's another really interesting takeaway from this to know that crows are smart. Um, and that they Ooh, do that. Another bird I would say, like visually, that is my favorite bird is a painted bunting because if you get the chance to look it up, a painted bunting looks like a you threw a crayon box onto a bird. It looks like a rainbow flying through the air, and you actually might find it here in Georgia. And that's a painted bunting. So my favorite birds, surprisingly, I have a couple, which I feel very proud to say. Um, of course, I would say bluebirds and like red robins, because at least for me and my family, those are signs of good luck. Um, that's what we say when we see them in our yard. Um, I also really like hummingbirds because they're beautiful. I actually, um, last summer, um, had a hummingbird literally come right in front of my face. And it was scary. It was a little scary because birds don't generally get that close to you. <laughs> but it was also a really beautiful bird. Um, so... Those are, um, you know, my personal favorite birds. Um, so another question is, um, what do folks need for birding at home or in their neighborhood? Like, do um, are <clears throat> binoculars necessary, I imagine, to be able to see them well? Um, you know, what are some of the things that people need for birding at home or in their neighborhood? I would say first and foremost, because I believe anyone can bird. I would say first and foremost, you need your eyes. You need eyes, ears, if you have if you have them. But you definitely need patience. Because I believe that birding is a lot about being still, about taking a moment to just like listen to what's around you and hear it. Because if you're looking, if you're darting from one thing to the next quickly, you might miss it. So, although I think that once you get the hang of it, having binoculars is a great tool to physically see the birds up close. If you can spot a silhouette or if you can hear what they're saying, then you can identify that bird without necessarily seeing it up close. So there are times when I'm walking on a trail locally and I might hear a bird just because I'm being still. So I encourage you the next time you decide to go out into nature or on a trail, which I hope you do, I encourage you if you haven't done that, there are so many trails out here that you can go on and I guarantee you'll find a bird on every single one of them, is just every once in a while, like every, every half a mile or so, just to stop in that spot, fixate, fix your eyes from where you hear your sounds because if you can hear a bird, then you can spot it. Yeah. And you just focus on a sound. An activity that I like to introduce to people when they first start birding is called a sound map. And a sound map essentially is you going into your backyard, take with a sheet of paper and maybe like a, a board to hold a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil or a marker or a crayon <laughs> and put an X in the middle of your circle, in the middle of your paper, and then sit in the middle of your yard or your space for 10 to 20 minutes. And in around your ex, I want you to write down everything that you've seen or everything that you've heard. So if you hear something in front of you, where you say, I heard something crowing, right? I heard something crowing over here. And if you hear something to your left, write it to the left of the left. 
write it to the left of the X. Or if you hear something on your right, write it to the right of the X. Or if you hear it behind you, write it behind you. But it kind of gets you to focus on where different sounds are. Because it's one thing to hear a sound, but it takes patience to know where that sound is. So, and then once you get more advanced and you feel more comfortable finding and deciphering sounds and being able to at least make sight line, which is like the line or the level in the trees or in the area in front of you where the bird is, whether it's on the ground or at the top of the canopy or in the middle of the canopy, you can figure out where the bird is. Oftentimes, if you guys are familiar with the face of a clock, if, you, if I'm looking at a tree and I'm with somebody and I see the bird and I don't want that person to point at the bird or try to squint for the bird, I will just politely whisper, I see a bird at three o'clock. And if the tree is a clock face, three o'clock would be right here. And, or right there. And if you use that, you can kind of figure out where a bird is. So if it's on the ground, it might be six o'clock. If it's on the ground and to a little bit up, it might be four o'clock or it might be seven o'clock. It's just all about being able to pinpoint sounds. And then from there, when you feel comfortable pinpointing sounds, see if you can find some binoculars. Some great um, brands that I would recommend would be Vortex and Eagle Optics, if you're looking in the market for some. I literally love that. Um, definitely, whether it's through birding or any activity, um, where you can get outdoors. Um, it really does like ground you and, um, you know, connect you to nature um, in a very unique way. Um, so we have one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, and that question is, um, how, do folk, how, how do folks identify the birds that they see? Um, is there an app or a website that can be a reference for people? Yes, so there are a couple apps that I like to use and all of these apps are available. Most of them are free. I would say the first and foremost is eBird. It's a citizen science app and it allows you to he not only hear bird calls, but to also make a checklist when you go out of what birds you hear. So that way it essentially creates a big map so that everyone can know what you saw in that area. So that way the next time someone else goes, they can be on the lookout for those birds. And that, so you can be like, okay, I see person A's list and they saw an American Robin. So when I'm out here, I'll see if I can hear an American Robin. Or if somebody says, I saw a bald eagle out here and you're at that spot, you can say, oh, there might be a bald eagle. I might spot one. So you kind of have an idea what to look for. Another bird that I would recommend, another app I would recommend would be the Merlin app. It's a more scientific app. It goes into detail about different birds and it also plays bird song. So a great way, two great ways to bring a bird into you if you are wondering how to get it to come to you or you hear a bird, but you want it to get closer. One way is called fishing and it's literally kind of cupping your hands and making that sound. So you cup your hands and you go. And another way is to play bird songs out loud because birds of that species will be drawn to that bird sound. So, and, I'm, and the Merlin app is a great way to do that. The last app I would say is the bird app that is from the Cornell lab. It's for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And again, this is another free app with just lots of information about where different birds are and a little background about when they are in the places that they are as well. You'll be able to see their flight patterns. So, cause different, different birds, some birds are seasonal as in they stay in different places in different parts of the year and some birds are stationary. So that app will give you information on those things. All of those apps I just mentioned are free. I encourage you to get them if you are interested. Another app that's not necessarily related to birds is called iNaturalist, and that'll help you identify different plants. And also, if you can identify the plants, then you can just figure out which birds are attracted to certain plants if you're looking for a specific bird. Um, I really thank you guys for the questions. 
really quickly before we wrap up, I have two things. Well, I have three things that I want to encourage you guys to do. The first thing is we have, we created a coloring book for kids online. It's called Nurturing Natives with Nature. Nurturing Nature with Natives. That's a mouthful. Try to say that three times fast. And it is on our website, georgiaaudubon.org for free for downloading. And it features all the birds I talked about today with a couple of other ones, as well as some native plants that are directly related to those birds. So you can color it in and then you can learn about them as well. It's a fill in the blank. So if you're interested and you like to color like I do, I encourage you to try that. I also would like to talk to you guys about an event that we have coming up. It's called Georgia Audubon Bird Stories. It's aimed toward younger children, but we read a bird book every single month, once a month, and it's always, there's always a STEM activity where we dive into specific topics about birds, such as migration and other top migration to this birding with disabilities, to learning about wrens and nest building. Um, this upcoming month in November, it'll be on the 18th. We're going to be reading a book called Crow Not Crow by Jane Yolen, and we're going to learn all about the world's misunderstood birds, as well as one of my favorite birds, which are crows. So I encourage you guys, again, that's another free event, um, and you can find that on our website. And if you ever have a need for me again, I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you again for having me. Thank you, everyone. One second. We're going to get Carlin to repeat what she said. But thank you so much, um, Kiana. We learned so much from you today um, and so much about birds. You had amazing, amazing pictures of the birds. So um, I think Carlin is able to put a lot of things in the chat. And... Um, Thank you so much. I learned so much, and I don't even really pay attention to the birds like that. So <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I think that we are going to plan something for when spring migration is. So before you go quickly, um, can you tell us about the fall migration and spring migration? Because my friends with bird, that are birders, they said that that's the best time to see the most birds. Is that right or wrong? Like, I don't know. That is right. So I would say spring migration and fall migration are really great times to see a lot of birds because you'll have a lot of visitors from different places that aren't normal to see out here, like Baltimore Orioles or Grosbeaks that'll be flying in from other parts of the world. And sometimes they'll stop here before making the journey further south. So this is a great time to see birds, specifically birds that aren't necessarily common to see around this area. Um, I know ruby-throated hummingbirds as a great example, although they're native, they you'll see them in an influx in the fall because they're, get, they're getting ready to leave. And right around this time is when they've kind of all made their transition. And then in the spring, that's also a great time to see a lot of birds because all those birds are now journeying back to their, to their nesting grounds, which is when they nest in the summer. So you'll see a lot of birds that are, might be tropical or that might be a little bit Arctic that like, like, a Canada, like a Canada goose, for example, might come down here, but it's called a Canada goose because it's from Canada. So they come and they visit for a time and then come back. So that transitionary period is the best time to see the most birds and spring migration starts end of February into March. So I would say by March and April would be the best time, again, to see a lot of really, really cool species. But you can still see great species now because there are birds that overwinter here. So for some birds, Georgia and the Southeast region, that's their migration spot. So you might also see some stuff during the winter. Thank you. 
Okay. You just so, gotta go out and look. <laughs> so I'll ask you three questions and then I'm going to have Carlin say what we missed. So let's close us out. So the birds that you gave in your presentation are birds that we can see all the time because this is their home. Then we have birds that we see only during the fall and spring migration. And then you said we have birds that this is where they migrate during the fall. So they're like extra sets of birds that aren't here all year, but that's when they're here, we can see them. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I'm gonna let Carlin close us out with the closing words, Carlin. Uh, so um, definitely hope that after watching this program that, um, you know, youth and their families are more encouraged to um, go birding. And as you said, if you hear something, just kind of take a moment to pause and see if you can spot that bird. Kiana mentioned um, a number of resources that I put in the comments for to help you in being able to identify um, these wonderful animals. Um, you know, as uh, was mentioned, we want to thank you all for tuning in and hope that you join us for Simlink's next program. Good night, everyone. And thank you again, Kiana and Georgia Autobahn. Thank you for having me.